Thank you, Lisa. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to talk tonight about Dynabunion. It's a uh, new Crossroads Lapidus product, um, something that I'm real excited about. Um, I've been uh, working on now for a while, and uh, I think we have something kind of special. So disclosures, um, I'm an, obviously a consultant for Crossroads Extremity and a BESPA consultant. I also do work for Orthofix and Extremity. Lapidus is a procedure that's been around for an extremely long time. Um, it's, it's a workhorse bunion procedure. And in recent years, it's really gotten a lot of uh, light um, and, and there's been quite a few articles regarding it. Um, so before we start going too deep into the history or the nitty gritty, I wanna talk a little bit about how we developed Dynabunion and why we developed Dynabunion um, and some of the struggles and successes and um, how we got to where we are now. Um, several years ago, Crossroads assembled a team of doctors and it was interesting. None of us did Lapidus the exact same way. None of us were totally happy with the current systems that we had or that we were using. And all of us had very strong opinions as to uh, what we thought was best and, and why we did what we did. Um, and uh, put into that group, we, we had to figure out a way that how we could succeed without compromise. Um, and I'll tell you about 90 minutes into the first meeting that we had, I, I never thought we'd be where we are today. Um, but that being said, things have uh, uh, worked out well and it, it's, it's uh, very interesting. Sometimes uh, uh, an event like that makes things better. And I think that was the case. And, and the reason why is we've developed a flexible lapidus system. You're not locked into any specific way of doing it. And I'll be honest, I think that's why the Dynabunion system is going to be such a big success. Um, there's probably 50 or 60 skilled surgeons on this call right now. And we can all do lapidus and we all have a way that we like to do things. And the Dynabunion system allows you to do your procedure with options. You can choose how you want to prepare your joint. You can choose how you want to reduce your joint. You can choose how you want to fixate your joint. And if you want to fixate across the intermetatarsal angle, you can do lapidus the way you choose, but you have a system that's going to make it easier and more reproducible. It's your procedure and it's your choice. There's another reason I love Dynabunion, and for those of you who know me, um, I'm a big car nut. Um, the, uh, one of the things that I love is I like to go fast, and Dynabunion doesn't slow me down. In fact, at this point in time, I cannot do a Lapidus as quickly and reliably without Dynabunion as I can with it. So um, it's definitely something that I'm interested in using because time efficiency in the OR is paramount. So going back a little bit, we'll talk a little about Lapidus. Lapidus is a workhorse, um, well-described bunion procedure. Um, I, in my opinion, do not think that you can be a doctor who takes care of all types of bunions if you don't have this in your bag of tricks. Um, it's really good for severe deformity. Um, it's really good if you have an arthritic TMT joint. Metatarsis primus varus, it's a way that you can correct um, one of the most important reasons, and, and uh, uh, one of the reasons I often use it is when you ha have a hypermobile TMT joint like this, or if you have a flat foot, this is a component of the flat foot quite often. Lapidus is tough because there's certainly a non-union rate associated with it, and also positioning of the metatarsal is challenging. If you get any dorsiflexion of the metatarsal, which can happen with inadequate fixation or non-compliance with early weight bearing in some systems or uh, some types of fixation um, and, and you end up with a transfer lesion and that's a problem in and of itself. So in a nutshell, Lapidus ain't easy if you want to do it really well. Um, just like this guy here who can walk down the street and make music playing multiple horns and multiple drums and tambourine and a cymbal, um, you know, there are people and, and um, probably a lot of people on this call can do a Lapidus without any instrumentation. But if you're going to do it right, you have to restore the IM angle, you have to rotate the first metatarsal, you have to check your plantar flexion position, you have to oppose and compress the joint, and then while you're doing all that, you have to apply fixation without disrupting your alignment. And quite frankly, that's easier said than done. And I know for myself, if you're really critical and if you really go back closely and look at cases you've done in the past, 
it's pretty easy to find on every case something that you probably could have done better. So in the recent uh, history of orthopedics and foot and ankle surgeon, uh, uh, surgery, lapidus systems have really come to the forefront. And I think there are certainly surgeons out there when they hear that um, from patients, you know, they, they say, you know, maybe I do need to be using instrumentation. Um, you know, do the uh, instruments fill an unmet need? Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, one of the goals, and, and I think one of, the, one of the purposes of any instrumented procedure in orthopedics is to try to help improve reproducibility. But you have to be careful because in some cases that can add to complexity and it can certainly add to OR time. And regimented time-consuming techniques are something that are not loved by surgeons. If you're going to do lap, lapidus correctly, a triplanar uh, correction, which has really become a buzzword now, is critical. Um, when you're doing lapidus, one of the beauties of it is you're correcting the deformity as close or at the cora. Um, and, you know, as we all know, um, you know, from uh, deformity correction, the closer you can do your correction to the cora, the better. Um, the other thing, um, and uh, one of the things that's interesting, if you look at bunion deformity, there's a rotational component and there's an intermetatarsal malalignment. And these don't necessarily have a linear relationship. There are cases where you can have a large IM and a little, uh, a, a small amount of uh, rotation. And there are cases where you can have a relatively small IM deformity, but a significant amount of rotation. And these, procedures and these problems require fine tuning. And one of the things, and, and this is something that I really harped on when we were developing this, is I wanted to come up with a way where we could separate our IM and our rotational correction. And that's one of the things that we'll show you. So with that in mind, with our diverse team, um, uh, we uh, you know, hashed out a goal of separating lapidus into separate steps that would be simple, that would be accurate and reproducible, and also that would be fast. We wanted good control over all three dimensions. And then um, we talk about adding this fourth dimension uh, with the Dynabunion system. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit further down the road. So this is a little animation of the surgical technique, which we'll go through. You start this procedure with a dorsal lateral approach. You come in. And just like most lapidus, you free up the joint, allowing to rotate. This is the osteoprecise cut guide. It gets pinned to the metatarsal, removes a wafer of bone parallel to the face of the metatarsal. The same guide then gets put back on and flipped around the other direction. At this point, you use your inner metatarsal redu reducer and your rotation reducer handle to correct the deformity. And once you have it corrected, you utilize the windlass mechanism to make sure that the guide is pressed up against the face of the cuneiform before pinning it. At this point, you perform your cuneiform cut and you can remove your guide and begin joint preparation. You've created two parallel surfaces with minimal resection that are gonna be congruent. This is a device that we call the rack block. This is a really simple device. We'll talk about this in a few minutes. It's designed to go on and compress the joint. Once on, you place an oblique wire which maintains your position and your correction. And now you apply your plate. The plate's held with olive wires and then a staple is drilled and inserted. This is a nitinol memory compression staple. Typically, I like to use one that has a 14 millimeter leg in the cuneiform and an 18 millimeter leg in the metatarsal. The staples have 18 millimeter bridges. Once impacted, you turn your attention to fixation. Ideally, biomechanically crossroads has shown that for a staple compression plate, you wanna use non-locking screws. You have options of either three millimeter or three and a half millimeter. You fixate the metatarsal first. Next up is something that's unique to the Dynabunion plate, the anti-drift bolt. This is an instrumented cannulated drill system with a solid screw that goes from the first metatarsal into the base of the second metatarsal. Uh, the plate's really interesting. We'll talk about this, um, the design of this a little bit, but it allows you to stabilize across 
between the base of the first and second metatarsal. And then once that's in place, you apply two non-locking screws into the cuneiform. So talking a little bit about what makes dyna the Dynabunion system, first thing we'll um, talk about is the osteoprecise cut guide. This is a cut guide uh, that has a single cut slot in it. Um, it's the same guide, you just turn it 180 degrees to use for the metatarsal, then the cuneiform. Um, with this system, we talk about uh, 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 a term that they've coined uh, C4, and it's uh, cut, correct, cut, and then compress. So um, this is the guide that you're gonna use for your cuts. Um, and you can see these are some pictures of the wafers of bone that you'll remove. These guides are really interesting. Um, uh, a lot of fantastic engineering went into them. Um, you end up with incredibly precise cuts. I, I, I'm always blown away with a, you know, a, a metatarsal that's about three centimeters from dorsal to plantar with a relatively thin saw blade, how, how you can so re reliably and reproducibly make these cuts. Um, minimal bone resection is uh, taken when you do this. The cut at a maximum can remove 1.6 millimeters. And then once the cut is uh, made, you remove the bone. But I talked earlier about options and this is a system that gives you the choice. There are some people who don't like cut guides. Um, and certainly in our uh, uh, design group, we had people who felt that way. You can do this system without the cut guide. You can simply open the joint and prepare it like you normally would freehand. And then you can use this freehand wire guide. The advantage of this is it still gives you the ability to use the instrumentation to dial in your correction and also compress your joint and maintain your reduction while you perform your fixation. And for some people, this is certainly going to be the way that they're going to want to go. Talking a little bit about how you go and perform your reduction, there are two different ways. The rotational joystick um, is attached to the metatarsal, and this is what you use to correct your rotational deformity. The uh, IM has a, um, a reducer that goes um, between the second metatarsal. It has a uh, hook that goes over the skin at the first metatarsal. Um, so the incision for this is extremely small. In some cases, um, especially with older patients or more severe deformities, a lateral release is necessary. Um, so I don't have to make two incisions in a relatively small place. I, I typically make my lateral release incision and this, this uh, reducer is small enough and, and easy enough to maneuver that you can pass it through the lateral release incision under the extensor tendon to the second toe around the second metatarsal and not have to make a second skin cut. But in some cases where you don't have to do that, you can uh, 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 just make an incision over the second. Um, in less severe IM deformities, sometimes I'll even uh, forego using the compressor and simply use the reducer handle with my hand between the metatarsal heads. So again, options, different ways that you can do, get your reduction. But once you've reduced your joint, made your cuts and prepared your joint for fixation, there's another device called the rack block. And this is something that's really simple and elegant. It's a low tech design. Basically, you have four wires, two in the cuneiform and two in the metatarsal. And when you slide this block down, it compresses. You can see in the animation there how the wires bend apart and it squeezes the joint together. And this is one of these things that you see it and you look at it and it looks pretty simple. When you actually get it in the OR and you use it, it's amazing. Um, additionally, we have uh, several different compression blocks. There's a zero, one, and two, uh, even a three. Um, these provide increased amounts of compression um, uh, if you're going to use, in some cases, uh, pay, uh, certain anatomy requires a recut guide to take off more bone. In that case, you would step up to a uh, one, two, or three rack block, or if you felt like you wanted more compression at the time of uh, your surgery, you can certainly do that. Um, but even the standard one is typically the one that I go to, and uh, it's really remarkable how nicely it holds it. The other thing that's neat is I like to take off my reducer prior to doing my joint preparation. And when you do that, the two metatarsal wires will fall into a medial direction. And it's really neat to see how much rotation you've corrected um, when you put the rack block back on and they 
and they go back into place. So here's an animation showing how the rack block has the joint compressed. Um, and then at that point, you place an oblique wire, you remove the rack block, and you're going to proceed with your fixation like uh, we showed in that animation. Um, the staple compression plate that you can see here has the anti-drift bolt. And one of the things, oops, sorry about that. One of the things that's really interesting and, and uh, one of the places where there's some fantastic engineering with this system is with the anti-drift bolt for several reasons. Number one, the head when fully seated is zero profile, but unlike a lot of systems out there on the market, there's no uh, pocket that you need to wallow out underneath the plate to allow this. Um, the other thing that's um, uh, interesting about the anti-drift bolts, the biomechanics, which we'll talk about in uh, some upcoming slides, the anti-drift bolt has a guide wire that's variable angle. Um, at this point, um, uh, I have yet to need to go off axis with where the anti-drift bolt is automatically positioned um, every single time it has hit the base of the second metatarsal without crossing the TMT joint. And one of the things that's nice about that is it leaves maximum surface area for healing at the TMT joint. You don't have any crossing lag screws. So we talked about the fourth dimension. and This is an animation. Um, this is a two pieces of bone that had ice in between them, bone block that had ice in between them with a staple compression plate. And it's really remarkable, but you can see as the ice melts, you see a gap. And then once it completely melts, that closes down. These staple compression plates are something that I've been using for the last few years. Um, and, you know, when I first, uh, I'll be honest, I was a skeptic. When I first saw a staple compression plate, I thought that would never work. And, and it, it, you know, I didn't think a staple would, you know, I thought the plate would neutralize that. But the reality is there's flexibility and there's a little bit of motion. And, um, anyone who's done a lapidus and has had some resorption at the fusion site, if you have a static locked plate, now you've got a construct that's inhibiting healing and preventing the biology of the bony compression that's really advantageous. Um, with this crossroads system, this is something unique and, and, and pretty special, not just for this system, but for their other fusions as well. But in addition to the Dynabundian plate, there's the regular lapidus plate from Crossroads that I've used for several years now. There's also a very small Z plate for a minimal incision. Additionally, there's uh, the keel lock staple system and the standard staple systems as well. So, so you're not locked into using a plate. It's not uh, jigged or you're not forced and, and you really can choose what's best. And I'll show you an example later on where I use the, uh, uh, the standard lapidus plate as opposed to the Dynabunion plate. So why have the anti-drift bolt? Well, Lapidus is shown to have up to a 12% recurrence rate. And the anti-drift bolt goes between the first and second metatarsals to help stabilize. There's a great, um, I, I absolutely love this article done by a bunch of folks, including Paul Dayton, um, you know, talking about uh, the biomechanics of fixation of the midfoot and in Lapidus. And the reason that this construct was chosen was the, uh, uh, the results of this study showed that the first to second metatarsal screw was really the one that was best uh, suited uh, to reduce instability in both transverse and coronal planes. I talked a little bit earlier about the tar targeting for the anti-drift bolt. Um, there's a guide with a wire and there's a laser line on the guide and there's a little laser line on the plate. And if you line those up and you have the plate positioned at the TMT joint, uh, I have yet to have one where I need to go off axis where it doesn't go into the base of the second metatarsal. So um, again, um, really slick and easy. Um, and then again, you can see here in this picture um, that's blown up how the screw sits below the surface of the plate, but the plate is flat on the bottom. Biomechanical testing of the anti-drift bolt. Um, Crossroads in-house has looked at this, and um, it's remarkably strong. And what's kind of surprising is the exact same plate with the exact same anti-drift bolt outside of the plate is 33% less uh, strong, is uh, less effective than having the anti-drift bolt through the plate. So really having this construct 
um, is critical and uh, uh, has been shown to be advantageous. So let's show some cases here so we can see what Dynabunion does in the real world. This is a case that I did back in June, 54 year old, um, relatively normal height and weight, pretty significant bunion deformity with an intermetatarsal angle of roughly 18 degrees and a hallux valgus angle of over 30. Significant deformity uh, uh, in regard to rotation as well that you can see. These are uh, pre-op x-rays, weight bearing, and these are pre-op clinical pictures. And I think it's really remarkable when you look at this, how much rotation there is on the, uh, uh, the hallux. So intraoperative x-rays from the case show a nice reduction. Um, I'm a huge Aiken fan. I, uh, uh, I was uh, born and raised at Penn State with Dr. Giuliano doing Aiken. So um, I almost always include one of those. And these are the clinical pictures in the operating room. I have taken my Dynabunion patients and I've weight, I weight bear them all immediately. I put them in a standard post-op shoe. Uh, I encourage them to you know, put weight through the heel, but um, I don't in any way cast them or take them off the foot. Um, and uh, uh, they either uh, go through their first six weeks in a post-op shoe or a short cam boot. Um, at that point in time, I convert them to a carbon fiber foot plate with a uh, stiff sole shoe until complete healing. This is six weeks. This is the six month follow-up. The reason I chose this one, this is one of the longest term patients that I have with the new Dynabunion plate system. And you can see um, really nice maintenance of reduction um, in a metatarsal ankle that's been reduced back to neutral, um, good congruency of the uh, first tarsal metatarsal joint um, and solid stable healing, no loose or prominent hardware. And clinically, you can see nice correction. When you compare it side by side, you can see how much uh, deformity was corrected. So here's a second case, a little bit of an older patient, 55 years old, um, pretty significant deformity that you can see here, um, cavus foot as well. And in this case, I use the older um, plate. Again, um, I use the instrumentation for the Dynabunion system, but I, uh, I felt like I wanted some more fixation. I wanted um, two screws in the um, first metatarsal, and this was relatively early on. Um, and and uh, I think at this point, I wasn't 100% uh, convinced uh, in the anti-drift bolt, but now that I've had, I've got uh, 20 or 30 cases under my belt with it, um, I'm a 100% believer. And what you can see, six weeks, excellent healing. And here it is at three months with a completely healed um, severe bunion deformity. And once again, a nice rotation with good stable fixation. Third case here, 39-year-old, um, um, overweight, 223 pounds, um, with, again, a significant deformity and a flat foot. Um, one of the indications, obviously, for lapidus is incongruency of the first tarsal metatarsal joint. And if you look on that lateral weight-bearing x-ray, you can see significant plantar gapping uh, that's clearly indicative of that. Clinically, um, uh, significant deformity as well. Here's fixation. This is, um, I'm a big believer when uh, you get your intra-op films, you really want to get nice films. Um, you can see here how that uh, anti-drift bolt is sitting right in the base of the second metatarsal. Um, and again, this was um, shot on axis exactly uh, uh, where the guide pointed it without any uh, need to deviate. And here are six week x-rays. The patient's been weight bearing since the day of surgery and three month x-rays with clinical pictures. You notice on this one, there's no uh, incision down by the base of the second metatarsal because this is one that I uh, uh, was able to reduce with the reduction handle and then simple manual pressure between the metatarsal heads to close down the IMA. So before and after. So in summary, Dynabunion, is a new way of doing lapidus. It's really interesting because it gives you flexibility. You can choose the way you want to prepare the joint. You can choose how you want to fix the joint. It's very time efficient. Um, at this point now, um, many of these procedures I've gotten done uh, where I have my implants in in 26 minutes. Um, and 
one of the things that's sort of unique to the Crossroads system are these staple compression plates and uh, certainly something that if there's any resorption, um, it can be beneficial for. At this point, I'd like to uh, take some questions. So we have one question here from Alan, um, okay. and it's a, it's a real good one. Um, he's asking, any concern on intercuneiform instability? And do I ever, uh, ever stabilize cuneiforms one and two? So um, with the anti-drift bolt, I'm not too worried about intercuneiform instability. Um, but I do sometimes place a screw between the cuneiforms. And typically, I'm going to do that in patients who are either heavier uh, or have osteoporotic bone quality. And we have another question here just asking why um, uh, a screw between the metatarsals versus the cuneiforms. Um, so um, looking back at that uh, uh, biomechanical article from Dr. Dayton, that seemed like the best way uh, to prevent um, instability and to stabilize. Um, so um, that's the reason that we chose that. Um, some people don't do it at all. Um, some people um, place uh, 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 fixation across the metatarsals or cuneiform joints um, on a case-by-case -case basis. Some people do it all the time. Um, I used to do it sometimes and a couple times early in my career, I got burned. So now I always place fixation across. Um, I'm also, uh, I've become a believer in the Grand Rapids idea of the um, uh, of grafting between the bases of the metatarsals, um, a stress strain relieving graft. So um, that uh, uh, if you can get a little spot weld over there, probably decreases recurrence rate. Um, and I, I certainly I, I've been finding with this anti-drift bolt, I get really nice um, fixation and compression across there with good healing. So another question with um, concern of stiffness over the uh, metatarsal one, two screw. Uh, I haven't had any, um, I'll be honest, usually I'm doing lapidus for hypermobility. Um, and um, uh, quite frankly, I think um, a lot of these patients, when you give them a stable midfoot for the first time ever, I think they, they, they tend to like it and they tend to, um, you know, feel like the foot's better. Um, you know, certainly, um, you know, if I look back on my athletes, you know, where they've had a Liz Frank injury, um, or they've had, uh, you know, hypermobility issues and you fuse them, uh, very often they, they, you know, they say that their foot feels better than it ever has. Um, but, um, the, the, and I think the big thing to keep in mind is if you look at these x-rays and if you look at where that, um, intermetatarsal screw sits, it is so proximal, um, that there is not a lot of motion there. So, um, it's not something, uh, you know, where I've seen loosening or, or had any stress fracture issues. So um, at least we have another question here. Um, it says, uh, if patient ever experiences pain from this particular hardware system, what is the recommended removal protocol? Would only the staple be removed? Um, uh, I don't, I don't think I would, if I was going to go in personally and do a harbor removal, I would probably remove everything. Um, the staple sits flush in the plate. Um, so um, unless something unforeseen happened, like the staple backed up um, in isolation, um, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't take it out. I've, I've quite frankly, um, never had an issue where it was just the staple that bothered somebody. Um, and once, you know, quite frankly, once you get a solid bony fusion, um, the hardware sort of is just coming along for the ride at that point. So if it's not prominent and irritating the soft tissue, then there's no reason to take it out. And uh, I have not taken any of my Dynabunion plates out, nor do I see a reason at this point why I would need to. So um, I have a question from uh, John Richardson asking about uh, how often do um, I perform distal work with this system? And my answer for that is my indication for doing a distal soft tissue procedure hasn't changed because of this system. I do it exactly the same as I did before. Um, my typical protocol um, when I do lapidus is I start by exposing the first tarsum and a tarsal joint and I free up all the capsular attachments. And then I check the mobility and I rotate the metatarsal um, into the position where I want it to be. And I look at the sesamoids. And if the sesamoids reduce nicely, 
then I proceed without doing a distal soft tissue procedure. If they don't, then um, that's when I stop and I go down and I do a, um, a release. I do sort of a relatively small release where um, I release uh, the lateral side of the first metatarsal phalangeal joint capsule and then the intermetatarsal ligament just lateral to the uh, fibular sesamoid. Um, the one thing that's critical is that you don't go and open up the capsule on the medial side um, before you do this. If you do that, then you're going to lose some of that rotational correction. Um, I have another question here um, about my post-op protocol, and I kind of glanced over that a little bit, so I apologize. Um, so my post-op protocol for this is um, I place a patient into a bunion-style dressing. Um, I put them in a post-op shoe. I let them weight bear immediately. I then um, uh, bring them back to the office, um, typically at a week for a dressing change, at two weeks for suture removal. Um, I give them a toe spacer if I think it's necessary. And um, at that point, I'll, I'll typically put them either in a post-op shoe or a cam boot until they hit somewhere between six and eight weeks. At that point, if x-rays look good and, and you know, clinically the foot looks like it's healing nicely, I'll let them progress to a regular shoe um, with a toe spacer with a carbon fiber foot plate or a stiff sole. Um, and I leave them in that, in that until healing occurs, typically somewhere in the ballpark of two and a half to three months. Um, uh, usually before that point, um, most people aren't looking to get back into a dress shoe, even if they are completely healed. Um, but at that point, then I'll release them to uh, full activity. Someone here is asking about speed. Um, and and uh, I mentioned that I felt this was faster. Um, so I have done several of these now, um, 26 minutes. And, and honestly, I, I, I'm not trying to rush. I, I, I want obviously all of these to be perfect, especially because I'm doing presentations like this where I need to show people my x-rays. Um, and um, before this, I, I've never been able to find a system where I could do it um, nearly as fast as I could do it. But with the cut guide, um, it's, um, I, I definitely now um, am quicker. I don't think I ever did a lapidus before this in less than 30 minutes. Um, so um, I would say on average, I'm probably about 10 minutes faster, but more importantly, um, in the past, if I, I think uh, uh, rushing would often uh, compromise reduction um, and, uh, you know, the ultimate result. And um, now I feel like I can not only go quickly, but it's, it's a uh, reliable, reproducible result. And I have another question from David just asking, you know, can you bend the plates upon dorsal anatomy and does that affect the compression stable? So um, the answer is you can bend the plates. Um, and quite frankly, um, what I prefer to do, and, and often when you do a big reduction, if you have a large IM, um, often there's some prominence of the uh, first metatarsal. And, you know, maybe this comes back to the hardware removal question earlier, but what I often do is instead of bending the plate, I'll actually take my saw um, or a rongeur and smooth down the medial edge of the proximal first metatarsal and the medial side of the medial cuneiform bone. And in doing that, I can put the plate on. Um, but the answer is you can bend the plate. And if you do bend the plate significantly, you, um, this typically uses a straight staple, but they're, um, they actually have the crossroads system has curved staples as well that you could put in that would probably sit nicely. But that being said, using the technique of smoothing the inside of the foot um, down um, the, uh, I've, I've not had to bend the plate. And um, also because of that, I um, uh, have not had to uh, do any hardware removals or have, are having any issues with hardware irritation at this point. I'd like to thank Crossroads and thank you, Dr. Campbell, for your time and in your contribution this evening. We certainly appreciate it.